They said, well, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. Could, it be, could Jesus have been John the Baptist? Well, only by what miracle? Resurrection. Resurrection. Could he be Eli? Uh, let's be careful of that word reincarnation because I keep, get, I keep getting it in catechism. Public school kids in catechism? What happens after we die, kids? Oh, we learn this. You, you, get, you get reincarnated as, some, as something else. They don't learn it in school. Be careful of that. We cannot assign that to teaching from our school. Where do they get that from? No, not even that. It's, it's what happens in a video game. Game over, come back. But what word do they use? Reincarnated. Oh, I got a new life. Ding. It's from Mario. It's from the most innocent of video games that anybody would play. You know, it's not from first-person shooter games or anything violent or weird. It's just from jumping over mushrooms in Mario. That's all. But that's where they're getting it from. It took me three years of confusion in catechism class to figure that out. But that's where that's coming from. But it might be that your grandchildren are struggling with this. So keep that in mind. Okay? That they don't know. You know, the, the problem with people quote, choosing or not choosing to come to church is that the children are completely losing the culture of, of what scripture says about our lives and our souls. Um, that's why I was going to use this coming weekend for, for one issue in Psalm, I'm preaching on Psalm 62. I happen to also be writing devotions on it this week. This is it's only happened once before in my whole ministry where the daily devotion is going to correspond to the Sunday sermon, but it, it's going to, it lines up, it just happens to line up this week. And, uh, and what is Psalm 62? My soul finds rest in God alone. That's that Psalm. Um, the leaning wall, the tottering fence, and so forth. But I think I'm going to end up spending about a third of the sermon talking about what the soul is. You know, we need to know, we need to rem remember that because people have the wrong idea. So far for today's devotion, I have 15 bullet points on just the soul. So, I don't know, maybe 17 at the before I'm done. We'll see. Do you guys mind, those of you who read them when my devotions go kind of long? No. I'm disappointed when they're short. <laughs> I think, oh, what was that, like two minutes? You must be preparing a sermon. They've never been two minutes. I the, the minimum is usually seven. Five? That, sorry about that one. I, uh, it also could have been that it was getting late and I was just physically tired. That happens too. Um, but, uh, so, uh, John the Baptist, Elijah? Could Elijah come back? He's sure, he's not even dead. Elijah or Enoch could show up at any moment. You know, watch your backyard after a tornado comes through. There might be Elijah sitting there. You know, oh, here I am. Um, I don't, it's a little facetious, but what about, why Jeremiah? Isn't that an interesting addition? Which, who, who was the greatest of the, of the prophets in, in, in that sense after Moses? Well, Jeremiah is the longest of the prophets. Word for word, the longest book of the, of the whole Bible is Jeremiah. Yeah? The people liked all the judging. Of the, I mean, they gravitated towards that judgmental mindset of the Pharisees and their leaders. So here's Papa. Mm. Did a lot of woeful lamenting and a message of judgment. Sure. Yeah. Be, yeah. In the final chapters of Jeremiah... I found more passages, or I have found more passages, that directly relate to Christ's descent into hell than any other Old Testament book. As Jeremiah not only condemns uh, the, 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 the nations around Israel, but tells them what's going to happen to them in hell. And it is uh, a chapter, chapters 48, 49, 50, uh, 51 maybe of Jeremiah, there are 52 chapters and all, 
um, as that goes on and on and on. And, uh, and he tells them, this is what your punishment is going to be specifically. A lot like the descent into hell. With Jesus descending to, the old word was harrowing of hell. The, uh, the telling them that they had lost. The announcement of the victory. So yeah, Jeremiah, pro- powerful, powerful prophet. Well, that was the opinion of people who were around. But Jesus said to them, But you, who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. So here at last, you are the Messiah. You are the Savior. Um, what does Peter have in his hands? A key. A key. Uh, two keys, one in each hand. I don't know if you can tell that but there there's one down there below also it might look like a spoon but it's a key um, so Jesus replies blessed are you Simon son of Jonah it's kind of curious that Peter's dad's name happens to be Jonah and wasn't Jesus just talking about the sign of Jonah they're not connected that way they just my dad's name is Ron the sign of Ron there wouldn't be the same thing you know um For flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not overpower it. I've realized more and more that I should not expect that everybody knows this. So let's spend a little bit of time on it. The word Peter here in Greek is Petros. Everybody say Petros. Petrus, it's the masculine singular word in Greek that means rock or stone, something you can hold in your hand. You can pick up, you can throw it, um, you can make a pile out of it, you can bring in a whole uh, cartload of it to shore up the side of your house or whatever, but stone, okay? And that's what Jesus calls Peter. Your name is going to be stone now or rock. Well, what would we say? Would we say rocky maybe? I have a, I have my sister-in-law's brother. Is my sister-in-law's brother my brother-in-law? I don't think, I don't think of him that way. It's my sister-in-law's brother, but he was a, a general in the, in the United States Marine Corps. And uh, his nickname was Stoney. Um, I think because of his stare, actually, but he's retired now. But So Stoney or Rocky or something like that, but Peter. And then, but then Jesus says, you're Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. The, which is not the same word. It's Petra, it's feminine, and in Greek it doesn't mean the same thing as Petras. So let's say Petra together. Petra. So Petra with an A means bedrock. Bedrock is not something you can pick up. It's something that you would build your house on. It is, it is that, 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 that solid foundation underneath the dirt. That, that's the Petra. So you are Peter, Petrus, but what you just said was the Petra, the bedrock on which I'm going to build my church. So what was Peter's Petra? The confession. You are the Christ, the Son of God. Um, so that confession is the foundation of the church. And the gates of hell will not overpower, is it you? No, it's it. The gates of hell will not overpower it that is the church. So this is where the Catholics make in the first pope or whatever. This is one of the spots, yeah, yeah. Um, Peter, as far as we know, never spent any time in Rome building a church or being pastor of a church. Peter um, did almost all of his ministry Where? In and around Jerusalem, he didn't leave. Um, Peter and John were in and around Jerusalem performing miracles and so forth, same time that Paul was beginning his mission trips. When Paul vanishes for a while on the trip that where, where, where we think that the Apostle Paul, after his third mission journey, maybe got to Spain. He had planned to go to Spain in Romans, he says that. So after Paul is in Rome, somebody has to write to the Galatians 
because there's stuff going on there. And who writes to the Galatians? Peter, that's first Peter. Peter, an apostle, of, an apostle, apostle. And uh, now you know what show I'm watching secretly on MeTV. Mission Impossible. Yeah, but uh, so uh, Peter goes and uh, Peter writes rather to the Christians in Galatia, Pontus, Cappadocia, Bithynia, etc. It's the Galatian Christians in Asia Minor. If they couldn't get Paul to write to them and there was a problem there, who are we going to have write to them? Well, let's get a famous apostle. So they get Peter to do it. So Peter does it. Peter writes to them twice. Um, but, uh, but Paul was the missionary there. Paul got to Rome a couple times, died there. As far as we know, Peter got to Rome once with his wife. And uh, not in the Bible, but in, in, according to tradition, that's where Peter and Mrs. Peter went to be put to death. Finally, that's where that happened. And that account is that it's a pretty reliable early account. Peter and his wife were both assigned to be crucified because they were Jews. They were, in other words, they were not Roman citizens. They're both carrying crosses into the arena or wherever it was. It may have been on a hillside, but we kind of think it was the arena as part of something that was going on, a greater, I'll call it, celebration of an execution of famous Christians or whatever. Peter comforts his wife. You know, we'll be with the Lord soon. You know, be at peace. And then as they're going to put Peter's cross in the hole, he said, have I told you this before? Peter says, I, I'm not worthy to be crucified like my Savior. So the guards say, oh, okay. And they just flip him upside down and drop him in. And then he and his wife die together. Is this still Cephas? No, it's the early church fathers. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, uh, I'll build my church. The gates of hell will not overpower it. Hell doesn't have power over the church. It will not overcome the church. The church, the Christian church, will continue until the end of the world. Um, it doesn't, doesn't make any difference, though, if, for example, England or Germany or the United States continues to the end of the world. No, not at all. But the church will continue to the end. Um, How do other countries, other uh, 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 church bodies, confessional Lutheran church bodies, how do they get their pastors? Where are they trained? Well, now we're training the natives of the country in their own seminaries with our Yeah, do you know some of those places? Yeah. Um, Lusaka, Zambia. Malawi is the, is the college. And Lusaka, Zambia is the seminary. Very good. There, we have an inroad to Vietnam. We have, we have something going on in Japan, but it's very small numbers. We have a bigger group right now in um, Hong Kong. Uh, John Lorenz started that seminary, and it's uh, been going now for, it's got to be at least 12 years, 10, 12 years. So the seminary in Hong Kong. And aren't seminary professors teaching online in Spanish in Crystal's academia? That's been going on for quite a while. Joel Sutton is partly in, responsible it's not for that. Seminary, yeah. But they're being trained. Yeah. And that's going on all over the world, actually. We now our newest mission, by the way, anybody know where it is? London. Yeah, London. Um so I, I, I just feel a little bit better about mission work when I know the language. And I know most of British English, not quite everything. Um, Jesus continues here. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. What mistake does a seventh grader make when reading this verse? Whatever you lose on earth will be lost in heaven. That's a natural seventh grade reading mistake. I don't blame them. Um, but loose and loosed. Yeah. Um, what might be a better word there? Well, since we're talking about keys, wouldn't a 
handy or translation be unlocked? Whatever you unlock on earth will be unlocked in heaven, you know, or untied or something like that. That might be a handier translation, you know, set free is what really the word is, but loosed is awkward. Released? Sure. Sure. This brings us to this part of the catechism. What are the six chief parts of the catechism? Apostles' Creed, Ten Commandments, Lord's Prayer, the big three. Then, Baptism, Lord's Supper, and Confession. In the original catechism, there wasn't a ministry of the keys at all. It's put together with confession now. Um, do you, anybody know where, uh, where the keys and confession goes? It's after baptism, but before Lord's Supper. So it's in there, which makes perfect sense chronologically in the life of the Christian. Which, you know, where does it go? Well, baptism we do with infants. So we get that. And then in the life of the Christian now, we'll talk about confession and absolution and forgiveness and then Lord's Supper. You need to know all of those things together. So to me, that makes perfect sense. Um, but I've, I'm, I'm in a kind of ongoing uh, conversation with Lynn's husband about what would be a better name for the ministry of the keys? Uh, because it's it's... To many people, it's not as descriptive as it might have been. Baptism talks about baptism. You know, could it be the, the, the gospel of forgiveness or something like that? You know, it might be uh, better for people. Um, I, uh, in the past, was in a disagreement with a teacher at a school about um, the importance of, of different things. And uh, the, the ministry of the keys got called into question about, you know, why, you know, why are we spending time on this? We should be spending time on comparing Lutherans and Catholics or something. And, but the, the keys is the, the entire gospel in a, in, a, in a single simple thing. Well, the, the keys, uh, the, the omission of the keys was, I, I, I'm, I'm not entirely sure. I've been talking to Ross Stellius about this. He's the one who teaches Lutheran confessions and so forth at the college now. But I asked him when the keys got added to the catechism and we're in the middle of wondering, was it a printer's error? Because even though it isn't in the earliest catechisms, it's in everything like shortly after that. Did Luther think, you know, that was supposed to be in there and it's not. It's in the large catechism, but just not in the Latin version of the small catechism and in the triglot, it's not there at all. So maybe a printer's error, but it came out very, very shortly after that. I just wanted you to know that little bit of trivia. Let's rem rem remember what it says, though. So can we all just read together? The keys, there are only two parts, so it's not that much. And if you don't have it memorized, just keep your eyes open. It's okay. Um, first, Let's all say it together. What is the use of the keys? The use of the keys is that special power and right which Christ gave to his church on earth to forgive the sins of penitent sinners but refuse forgiveness to the impenitent as long as they do not repent. Where is this written? The holy evangelist, we're, we're still reading, the holy evangelist John writes in chapter 20, Jesus breathed on his disciples and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone his sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. And the public use of the keys, second, how does a Christian congregation use the keys? A Christian congregation with its called servant of Christ uses the keys in accordance with Christ's command by forgiving those who repent of their sin and are willing to amend, and by excluding from the congregation those who are plainly impenitent that they may repent. I believe that when this is done, 
It is as valid and certain in heaven also as if Christ, our dear Lord, dealt with us himself. Forgive me, do you remember a sermon maybe three weeks ago where this very point was made? Forgiveness from the church and forgiveness from Christ, I'm testing you, are one and the same. Yeah, that's what I meant by that. And then finally, where is this written? Jesus says in Matthew chapter 18, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. That's a repetition from what we just have here in chapter 16. So same doctrine treated three times. On your sheet, I skipped a whole bunch of stuff that's there from my 2014 Matthew class. Um, and now we're in the middle of page two. The ministry of the, or use of the keys is the authority given by God to three groups. First in chapter 18 or 16, what we just had, Jesus gave this authority to who? To Peter. There it is. It did go to Peter first. Whatever you, Peter, bind on earth will be bind, bound in heaven and so forth. However, Jesus expands that twice. It doesn't stay with Peter. So you were right. Who pointed that out? Was that Diane? Was that you? That this is where the Catholic doctrine of the papacy comes in. But it, it gets expanded immediately by Jesus himself. So it begins with Peter. In chapter 18, it gets expanded to the apostles. And that's what we just read. And then in John 20... Jesus then expands it even further. And who does it go to? The whole church. Yeah, the whole Christian church. So that's why Luther says in the catechism, um, the, today the holy Christian church with its called servant. Yeah. There are a lot of different words in the confessions for the called servant. The one we normally use is Pastor, why don't we say priest? Partly, although if other denominations use pastor, would we have a confusion there with them? Maybe. I, the point I want to make about the priest is that the priest does something we don't do. Well, that's that's correct though. But they offer sacrifices. A priest offers a sacrifice. The pastor does not because the book of Hebrews tells us three times in Hebrews 9, 10, and 10, uh, 9 something, it's 10, Hebrews 10, 10 is the easiest one to remember, that Christ was the one sacrifice once for all, for all sin, for all people, for all time. So that we don't offer sacrifices any longer and that's bloody sac or unbloody sacrifices. Um, oh, I was talking about the, 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 the role of servant, but I want to continue with the chapter here. He commanded the disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Christ. We call that the messianic secret. Why did Jesus command people not to tell anybody different things? Well, Jesus is himself going to lay down his life at exactly the moment and the place where he wants to. And so is he going to do it up here at Caesarea Philippi? No. So, so as not to get the Pharisees and Sadducees and priests and others up here at Caesarea Philippi angry, he just says, just don't tell people this yet. Um, there is going to be a turnaround where Jesus will begin to say, from now on, go and tell people. It's going to happen soon. It's going to happen soon. And from your in your memory, if this helps, then keep it in your mind this way because it's basically exactly right. On the way up to the Mount of Transfiguration, the secret is in place. Don't tell anyone, don't tell anyone, don't tell anyone. But as he comes down the Mount of Transfiguration, he starts saying, or, or rather, he just stops saying, don't tell anyone. And he sends people off to tell people, go and tell what you've heard. Because from the Mount of Transfiguration, 
if you can, it's almost like a like a like a little kid on a on a on a what do they call a radio flyer, little red wagon, from the Mount of Transfiguration. It's zoom to Jerusalem, up to Golgotha. There is a detour across the river into Perea for a half a year, but that's that's the that's the zoom though. But now we're now we're going, okay. But it's two years, more than two years. Don't tell anybody, and just a little bit under a full year of go ahead and tell people. So now you kind of know where we are chronologically in the life of Christ. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that they that sorry, that's a big pronoun mistake, that he had to go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders, chief priests, and experts in the law, and be killed and on the third day be raised again. Could that be any clearer? Hardly. I, 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 how could that be any clearer of what's about to happen? I have spent time trying to discern if there is a different suffering from the elders that's from the chief priests and from the experts in the law. And I'm not sure I can differentiate between the three. At first, it seems like, oh yeah, maybe one would be secular, like the, the king, like Herod, and one would be spiritual, and one would be more legalistic. I, I'm not sure I can differentiate that, but they certainly are all involved together against him, aren't they? This is the, the mob, the group. This is the one that's uh, at fault, primarily. The elders, who are basically a spiritual, uh, I mean a, a non-spiritual group, the elders are the, are the leaders of the towns, and then finally the king. And then the chief priests and the experts in the law, there's a separation there. The priests and the scribes are different. The, the experts in the law were the Levites who were teaching their children. They're the ones who taught reading and writing and so forth and taught the kids their Moses and so forth. But the priests are the ones who are carrying out the sacrifices in the temple and the chief priests, which is a weird term because how many high priests are there at a time in the Old Testament? One, that's it. In the New Testament, there's, they're, they're, it's like one a year. Um, and why was that? It was entirely because of Rome. Rome started dictating, pulling the strings on who's high priest, who's not high priest. And people were in favor, out of favor. And you have retired priests, which is why you have Caiaphas, who is the high priest, correct? And his father-in-law, remember his name? Annas. Annas, the, the other one. And there are many others. There are, there, there's, there's one named John, and they, it just there, there are a bunch of them. Um, all connected. Now at this point, so Jesus has mentioned the coming suffering. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, may you receive mercy, Lord. This will never happen to you. But Jesus turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are a snare to me because you are not thinking the things of God, but the things of men. You know, Almost as if Peter is saying, oh, yeah, don't talk about being put to death. I don't want to hear about that. We'll protect you or pray that God will not, that the Father will not let this happen to you. But Jesus is, of course, thinking, this has to happen to me. This is why I came into the world. There is no other point of the incarnation of Christ than the forgiveness of our sins. That's why that's such a vital part of our regular weekly worship and our daily prayers. It's the forgiveness of our sins. The, 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 uh, Jesus says, don't be scared of the one who can kill your body. Be frightened of the one who can kill your soul forever in hell. And who's that? Be careful. It's God who destroys your soul in hell your body and soul. God punishes you in hell. The devil is, is the guy in the next cell. He's not in charge in hell. And we, we often think that way. Um, but I, 
It is, it is a strange thing to train yourself to anticipate the errors of children. You know, but as you're teaching catechism and training Sunday school teachers, you have that reminder in always. Um, yeah, they might have this wrong. I, this used to happen to me all the time. Not all the time, but it happened to me several times in a row in my early years in New Ulm. You get a phone call from the hospital. Why do they call St. Paul's? Because we go. They call other churches and they don't show up. They call us and we go. Tom and Don, Pastor Henning and Pastor Sutton and I constantly reminded each other of that. We have an opportunity when the hospital calls, go. Um, because they're, they're, they, they call us because we go. And you go to the ER and there'd be some terrible tragedy. A, a child has died. And you get there and I find, oh, the nurse is doing my job for me. Because the nurse has just told the family, he's an angel now, isn't he, pastor? The first two times I heard that, I think it was the first two times and not the first five, but the first two times I heard that, I didn't know what to do with it, and I thought, I'm not going to get into a theological argument with a nurse in front of a family that just lost a child. This is not the moment for that. So we'll just move past it. Later, I came up with the correct phrase. I think it's the only correct phrase. If you're going to say something, what's the, the, the better way of putting it in order to correct the nurse? The, the, the thing I found out was when they say, isn't he pastor? I would say, oh, Better than that. That's so I I just took control of the conversation, didn't I? Like, oh, the nurse doesn't know enough, which is absolutely true in this case. I mean, not, not never our nurses, the members of our congregation, but but there would be nurses who would do that. Um, because there's a mistaken, there's a mistaken uh, uh, idea about the difference between an angel and a soul. Mostly because of that stupid Christmas movie. Right? It's a wonderful life. And, and so, but then you get to go on from there. No, no, because this child's body will be restored to him in heaven. You will hug your child again. That's, that's the moment when, when, when the emotion breaks through and we begin to talk about the condition of one's soul. Um, is that? Go ahead. Yeah. And your will, Lord, is always perfect. You're not thinking about what God wants. Yeah. And yes, I get it's a solid presentation of Jesus walked to his death and that that's his purpose. But practically speaking, this helps me to not say, God, I have this idea. And I hope you agree with me. Yeah. And worshiping myself. My will is God, not yours, Lord. Yeah, that's the idolatry of the human opinion. Yeah. Oh, you brought that word back into the conversation. The culture. Right? False doctrine is, in, in, in every culture, it gets in in a different way. And the, the, um, the, uh, uh, the flavor of the month that the devil uses is just whatever's popular right now the devil loves currently the, 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 the big temptations and because the, 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 the big way of tempting people in our culture today is with advertising. So what sells? Sex, envy, I got to have, right? That, that old beating the Joneses thing. And these days, fear. Is there another one besides those? Oh, good. Yeah, the feelings. Oh, the feelings. 
My feelings, my feelings. Yeah, yeah. It is all First Commandment stuff. We're starting to lose people. Uh, I'm, I've, I've gone beyond, so. Um, um, but uh, go with Jesus. We'll pick it up here next time, and we'll get to the Mount of Transfiguration soon. Thanks for letting me do this. God bless you. You've been listening to Invisible Church, the Bible study podcast from St. Paul's Lutheran Church, New Wall, Minnesota.